I recently moved into a new apartment with my boyfriend, who works away for long periods of time. An older man started to become friendly with me, knowing I was new to the complex. I made the mistake of telling him I lived with my partner, but he's away for work for a while. Almost every day after that, he came knocking on my door and waiting if I didn't answer. One time I was out in the common grass area playing with my brother, who was two, that I would occasionally have over. I saw him coming my way and quickly picked my brother up. The man started making conversation, asking about my brother, and literally tried to grab him out of my arms. I held onto my brother tight and pulled away, and as he started to cry, I made the excuse that I have to go feed him, and walked away. I'm extremely bad with confrontation, as you can tell. A few days later, I heard a knock at my door and opened it without thinking. He walked straight past me into my apartment without even saying a single word, just smiling. I asked him if he was doing okay and he said, I'm good, just wanted to see what your place looked like from the inside, and started walking into every room. He checked all my windows and commented, Huh, so all your windows have bars on them except the bathroom. I nervously laughed and said, Yeah, I guess they do. I didn't know what to do, so I walked out into the front garden, hoping he would follow me out of the apartment to try to talk to me. I just wanted him out because I was scared to anger him. Once he came out, I closed my door and said, I have to go to the shop now. Sorry, it's gonna close soon. And I walked off. That night, while hanging my washing out, another neighbor introduced herself. I told her what happened and asked if she knew the man. Apparently he'd been doing the exact same thing to her. She told her partner that this creepy neighbor was doing the same things to a young girl and that was his last straw. He ended up going and talking to the older man. After that, the older man only tried one more time that I know of to knock on my door, which I hid in my kitchen for 10 minutes until he left. I haven't heard anything since and haven't seen him around, but I wake up at night panicking, thinking that he's planning on doing something to me. I want to start this off by stating that this is my first ever post, but I've always loved listening to the stories of the subreddit on YouTube, and I wanted to share my own. For some background, I'm female and I was 17 at the time of this story. I used to work at a pizza place in my hometown. The job sucked in many ways, but the worst part about it was that my manager had no problem leaving girls alone to close. Granted, the town I grew up in was small and boring and many people left their doors unlocked, but I still thought it was risky. On this particular night, I was closing the shop alone at around 10. The last thing I had to do was take the garbage out, and the dumpster as well as my car were located on the side of the building. While I was making my way to the dumpster, I immediately noticed a man making his way towards me from across the shop's parking lot. He's wearing jeans and a black sweatshirt, and he had some sports cap on. Right off the bat, my heart dropped, and I got incredibly nervous. I threw the trash away and began speed walking to my car, when this guy says something. You got a cigarette? My paranoia told me that this question was sketchy as hell, and I struggled to respond for a moment. I just said no and got into my car, hastily trying to get in. And I shit you not, as soon as I closed my door, he booked it to my car and tried to open it. Obviously, I locked it immediately. I instantly started bawling and turned my car on. The man clubbed my window with his fists a few times without a word before booking it again into the nearby streets. I called my mom and then the police once I got home, and they opened up a small investigation but could never find the guy. There were no other cases of something like this happening somewhere else in the town, and so I think he probably relocated somewhere else to avoid being caught. I really have no clue what that man wanted to do. Sorry if this was kind of lame or anticlimactic, but it was pretty damn scary to me. I have this friend, Rick, 
who I believe has been stalking me for the past two weeks, if not longer. I'll give some background information, then get into the problem I'm in. Thanks in advance for any advice and help. We met back in 2014 in high school. He was always a quiet but nice and easygoing guy. We grew very close and I saw him as a brother. He didn't have a very smooth childhood. He saw his parents argue a lot, often for years. His mom even cheated on his dad and he saw the effect it had on him and the whole family. But he wouldn't suspect anything out of the ordinary just meeting him at first. Around 2016, he started to become a bit paranoid and would seem a bit pessimistic at times. He never had many friends, neither did I for that matter. We had two other friends together that we saw often, and we were the only ones he trusted. I saw him have this strange panic attack when he ran out of a restaurant we were at, and he ran to a nearby park and yelled at people. I called his dad to come and get him, and he got him in the car and gave him a pill. Apparently, this had been the second time this happened recently then. Fast forward to June 2021. In between the last episode slash attack to now, Rick seemed normal as he could be, but I noticed he was a bit off and has been since then. He met a girl in college months before that he says he fell madly in love with, but she rejected him when he asked her on a date and blocked him on everything right after graduation. It took a massive toll on his emotional and mental state. He had another episode where he ran outside his house and actually provoked someone, and they punched him in self-defense. And then his parents took him to the hospital during that summer, and he was officially diagnosed with schizophrenia. So, from late 2021 until now, I've noticed he's quieter. He still cracks jokes, and you can have a decent conversation with him, and he still seems like a nice guy. But there's been some stuff recently that I truly think is alarming and that is why I'm making this post. So, I'll cut to the chase. For the last six weeks, we've hung out three times. This was actually after a hiatus where we didn't see each other since February this year because I started working more hours and went to night shift. Each of those three hangouts, I've noticed he looks at me in a really strange way. Like he's aroused and imagining me naked or imagining himself hurting me. We're both male and heterosexual. I'm saying this to preface what I'll mention in a bit. He also mentions how he's still in love with that girl from school, but proceeds to call her a slut, whore, and wants to assault her and kill her right after. He has said this numerous times, and even mentions going to the elementary school she goes to. He sent me a picture of that school on Google Maps, with arrows pointed at it and firework emojis last week. He also admitted to having parked outside her home, and sitting there for hours about five times back in 2021. For the past week, he's been insisting on hanging out several times a day, and when I was at Chili's with my parents on Saturday, he sent me a message saying, Chili's. He's able to see me since I'm on the Snap Map on Snapchat, since I use the app often to talk to other friends. When I went to the mall right after, he said, You're going to the mall again. You were there yesterday. Which is true. I went to the mall twice. Once with my mom, then with both my parents the day after to get some stuff, since one of our favorite stores was closing, so we wanted to check out some good deals. On the drive home that day, he messaged me saying, You didn't work today. We should have hung out. I replied, Maybe Wednesday, which was yesterday, and I didn't see him because I'm genuinely creeped out. So, the day after, on Sunday... He again insisted on seeing me, but I went to go play soccer instead with other friends, and then went to go do laundry afterwards, and when I was at the laundromat, he sent me a soccer ball emoji and a laundry emoji, indicating he saw me on the snap map. Here's the thing, he keeps mentioning where I am, and it's always within 10 minutes of me being on my phone. He's actually done this for the last two years, but never this frequently. It used to be like twice a month and I brushed it off but now I'm noticing something actually concerning. He's also been calling me boyfriend and sending heart emojis the past week. And when I told him I might see him this week, which I won't, but I said so just to not make him mad because I'm actually fearful of him hurting me or others. He said, you think I can wait that long to see my boyfriend? 
This past Sunday, I didn't reply to him for about four hours, and he kept asking if I'm mad, and then said he wants me to reply no longer than a minute after he texts me each time. I have the feeling he's just constantly on his phone, looking for when I'm active on social media, and I really don't know why. He also admitted to me a month ago that he makes fake profiles to be able to gain access to that one girl's Instagram and look at her pictures, and he says he does stuff to them. He even uses the nudity app to take her clothes off, he said. All of this is concerning. He currently doesn't have a job, and he hasn't had one for the last two years. I'm the only friend he sees and talks to, and I feel he's developed a compulsion, fixation, or dependence, or a mix of all three on me. And as I've mentioned, he has said he wants to assault and kill the girl that used to be in his class, and he knows where she lives and works. I have not mentioned my thoughts on this to him again out of fear. He currently takes Risperidone daily, and he said he's been seeing a new therapist for just a month now, but I don't know if any of those are even working. I'm asking for any advice on how to approach this and what to do. My concern is that if I tell anyone like the police or the girl, he will find out and retaliate by hurting me or my family, as he knows where I live. Any help is appreciated. This story is from a couple of years ago, when my buddy and I were out running and stumble on something very strange. I lived in quite a small town at the time, with a large industrial plant nearby where most people work at, but there are a few that don't get their breadcrumbs from legit sources, for example, local gangs. Luckily, when they have their dispute, they usually shoot and harass the other gangs in the area and spare locals who live there. I have not stumbled upon any unrest in this matter and have never been in any crossfire before this day. Me and my buddy were preparing to take a long run around town, taking some small roads and trails to get the miles clocked in. We started running some back roads and just enjoying the run and the small talk about some games we played at the time. We took some right and left turns, and after a couple of miles, my friend says that he knows a small path to the next neighborhood. It's a small path over some train tracks where there weren't usually trains running, and it's quite a fun path with some ups and downs. Also, it's a nice forest to be in, a very sparse pine tree forest with some very large trees. We run for like one minute on this path, and I can see a bit further down that a duffel bag is laying under a small bush on the right side of the path. It's a new bag that seems to be full of something. In my head, I'm thinking at first, it must be someone who'd forgotten it there, but then I remembered this path is not any path someone's going down with a duffel bag. It's usually some people who are running like us. I say to my friend, did you see that bag? And he of course answered, yes. Then I asked him, shouldn't we look what's inside? Nah, it's probably nothing inside, he answered. So we continued down the path and didn't think much of it. Now the strange part comes. We've just been past the train tracks and a couple of yards further we see a man standing in a black suit and he seems to be talking to someone on the phone. He seemed quite surprised that we were running there as well as us about him standing there. He had some black leather gloves on. He was quite muscular and the phone looked like the phone you get from a kiosk. My heart had started racing and my adrenaline had started pumping. What was this man going to do with us? He maybe had a gun on him, I thought. No man with a suit has any business to be here in the forest, but I tried to act cool and nodded him a hi. But he was still on the phone talking to someone and seemed not touched by us running beside him on the path. A while after we had encountered this strange man in the black suit, my buddy and I asked each other what was in that bag. He must have been searching for that bag. That's when I understood what could have happened to us, if maybe we took that bag with us, or maybe searched the bag's contents and he came strolling down that path. This story still gives me shivers down my spine to this day, but I can't stop thinking about what could have been in that bag. But I know for sure that I don't want to see that man in the suit ever again.
When I was 18, I used to work in a grocery store as a cashier. I got along well with most of my co-workers. We used to take lunches all together in the break room because there was only one big table for everyone to be seated. Everyone would talk to everyone, except for this guy, Jeff. Jeff was a butcher at our store. He wasn't mean to anyone. He wasn't weird or anything. I used to think he was more shy because he never talked to anyone other than to the others of his department. Sometimes, though, when people would tell jokes, he would smile, laugh a little, so I just guessed he didn't want to be disrupted and he wasn't really a friendly person. I used to be a supervisor when this story happened. One night, I came to work to close the store. I went upstairs first, then went to clock in and talk with my manager to see how everything was going before starting my shift. When I went into her office, the first thing she told me was something along the lines of, if the radio calls, say you don't know anything, do not answer their questions, do not get involved. I was genuinely confused about what was going on. I had just arrived and already it was implied that there was something big going on. I had no idea what the fuck was happening. Eventually, she told me that someone in the store was accused of murder. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. At this moment, I had no idea of what had happened yet. I ended up figuring out it was Jeff with the conversations going around. Basically, Jeff lost it the night before. He killed his father, who was a retired policeman. He attacked him with a katana. The media also revealed that years prior to that, his brother and him had been involved in sexual assault stories. The most disturbing part to me was that I worked with him the day before the guy ended up not being found guilty because he was psychotic the night it happened. Thanks for your patience while listening. I don't exactly have another conclusion. Hey everyone, so I'm part of an online friend group on Discord. We're all from the same country, but most of us are from different cities. Everything was going fine between us, until suddenly, there was a series of unfortunate incidents where I had minor fallouts with them. I went through personal frustrations, and I unknowingly projected them onto people on the server. These fallouts continued over April and May, until one day I left the group in a frenzy. I admit I was pretty childish in how I acted with the group. I remember to apologize to all the people there for my actions, and most of them forgave me. Afterward, the night before June began, one of them texted me asking if I knew certain people from my high school. I told them I did. I asked the person how he knew them, and he revealed to me that he knew a lot of people from there. Suddenly, the conversation took a dark turn. He started talking to me in a sinister tone, telling me he had some of my personal information, what college I went to, my route to it, who I hung out with in both my old high school and college, and he even claimed to have some of the photos from my personal Instagram. When I asked him how he had all of that, he claimed, A, he tailed my car, and B, kept repeating the phrase, the people at your college aren't bad at providing information. At that point, I was scared to death. He told me if I didn't return to the group, and if I didn't apologize to a specific person, he'd first dox me, and then wait outside my college to kidnap and then kill me. After the conversation ended, I rejoined the Discord group out of fear and then went to bed. The next couple of days were rough. The fear of what he could do to me gripped me tightly. I lost my energy and motivation the ability to engage in my usual day-to-day -day interests, and I even lost my appetite for food. My family and friends both noticed that something was wrong with me. I was shaking constantly, my heart was racing all the time, and it felt like my life was stopped dead in its tracks. I was too scared to even tell other people about what was going on. Fearing for your safety is a fate I wouldn't even wish on my worst enemy. Normally, death threats like these wouldn't scare me, but what made the situation different were the following points. That guy lived in the same city as me, and relatively close to my neighborhood. Before this incident and my fallouts, he'd often tell us stories of how he got into major gang fights and dangerous situations. 
I had never received serious death threats before. I pretty much have been safe my whole life. Since this was my first time facing such a situation, it seriously traumatized me. A couple of days later, I contacted him again. I begged him to stop dictating me like that. Finally, he revealed to me his reason for scaring me. He told me he wanted to humble me, so I stopped being too moody in the group and rejoined. He said he wasn't dictating me anymore, but still wanted me to remember the conditions he put me on, as a request this time and not a threat. The situation was technically over after that. I did talk to other people in the group, including the girl he wanted me to apologize to about what he had done to me, and they all responded the same way. They assured me that his threats seemed mostly empty and that everything was okay. None of them approved of what he had done, but I also told them not to talk to him about it out of fear for my safety. This whole ordeal left me shocked. Even though he told me he wasn't dictating me anymore, the effects of the whole situation took a toll on me. It's been a month and a half since this happened, but it still hasn't left me. My image of the group has been tainted. Every time I come across the Discord server and see him and others, my heart suddenly fills with dread. I've been thinking about leaving the group one day, but right now, I feel stuck. Normally, people would tell you to cut abusive friends off, but I find that difficult because he's part of the same group, and everyone else in the group has been incredibly kind and supportive of me. My mind keeps telling me that cutting that guy off means cutting everyone else off. Secondly, yes, I do have the option of just cutting him off my private socials, but I'm scared that he might threaten me again, even though he never implied he was going to force me to stay friends with him. So, this is my present situation. I'm stuck in a friend group that I don't want to be part of anymore, because one of the people in that group thought it was a good idea to humble me by traumatizing me with threats. I've been experiencing traumatic reactions for a month and a half, where I have episodes of racing heart rates and an inability to eat, sleep, and engage in activities. I know that leaving the group is the best thing for me, but I'm too scared of what's going to happen to me if I do so. I even went to a psychiatrist about this, and he diagnosed me with PTSD. Right now, I feel like shit. I keep thinking about how peaceful life would have been had I not made the mistake of joining their Discord server all those months ago. My incident with that guy has made me realize just how evil some people can be. I want to avoid him, but because of my paranoia, I sometimes force myself to engage with the group normally. I don't ever want to meet him or interact with him in any way. I want to cut him off and forget about him completely, but I don't see any way out as of right now. It feels like I was slowly lured into a cage and immediately imprisoned the moment I settled in. I know very well that leaving the group is the right option for me right now, because if I don't, my mental health will continue to decline. But I need help in finally achieving that goal. In a way, this is a cry for help. It's early June. I'm starting to regret parking a mile away as I'm leaving my friend's jewelry studio, but it's a beautiful day. Anyways, so here I am walking down the street, crossing the bridge, admiring the river and whatnot. In the distance, the faint sound of bongos echoes off the buildings and into the street. Could it be a bar, a car sound system, whatever? As I get closer to the omnipresent bongos, I realize the source of the sound is coming from a stationary object. I've identified the source of the bongos. If you've ever seen the Tim Burton film, Big Fish, you will know Danny DeVito plays a circus carny, all dressed up with a curly mustache, a truly grimy vaudevillian display. Now imagine this, but as a six foot eight, burly, pot-bellied homeless man with a boombox. My first internal reaction was, wow. He looks like a six foot eight homeless Danny DeVito impersonator. Upon spotting me, Danny DeVito 2.0 turns to me and growls, Hey, come over here, and begins approaching me. 
I say, no thank you sir, and quickly take off from my car. I'm speed walking to my car. Between my footsteps, the bongo music continues playing, louder as he approaches. At this point, I'm almost to my car. I'll knock the car with my fob and practically leap into the driver's seat. I fumble for the lock button. The side door lock doesn't work. He's reaching for my passenger door as I'm turning the key in the ignition. Car unlocked. Next thing I know, I'm driving away, and he is stumbling off the curb, reaching for my door handle to no avail. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevallo, Alabama. My mother is the oldest of five children, and she has three sisters and a brother, who's the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people in total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle, if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembered the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding, and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want the help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he dragged her out of the car. So my father cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seat right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they'd just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he'd just taken his family out for target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continue driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming, he killed that lady, he killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work, just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop.
Every weekday, I would wake up early for a morning workout, then head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. Most of my drive was just putting loud music on, trying not to fall asleep and it being a freeway before 6 a.m., almost everyone was going at least 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway, which I would only use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually no more than 75 miles. And while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north to south. An on-ramp from a main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day one from the eastbound side, and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense, but basically, I got on from the eastbound side right as three cars were entering from the westbound side. One was some sort of orange, sportyish car, and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make and model they were, but I remember them being fairly uncommon models, not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in the front of this orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes, and the car in front would cut him off, while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down, before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence, and some asshole drivers but I definitely got the vibe that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. At the time of this happening, I was 19 and homeless in a big city. I just recently moved to a city and was on my way back to the shelter from a public library. I was taking a shortcut through an alley wide enough for a car to go through, and I had noticed an old beat up looking car come into the alley and driving slowly behind me. I figured they probably just didn't feel like they had enough room to pass me, so I picked up the pace and crossed the street. They drove to the same area of the street that I was on and kept pace with me. There was just one guy in the vehicle. He looked to be about mid-twenties and Hispanic. He rolled down his window and said, Hey, are you okay? How old are you? I look like I was about 14 and I'm pretty short, so I got that question a lot. I responded, I'm fine. I'm not a minor if that's what you're asking. He asked me if I needed a ride and I politely declined. Then he starts telling me he's just really concerned and wanted to talk really insistently and smiling through almost the entire interaction. I asked him why we couldn't just talk on the street where we were, and he dodges the question and again asks me if I'm sure that I don't want to ride. My gut was telling me he had bad intentions, and if I were as young as I looked, I might have fallen for it. Instead, I looked around me to make sure I wasn't going to get ambushed, and walked up to the passenger window. I told him in the most threatening voice I could muster, I know you don't really want to talk. I'm sure you have worse things in mind. I paused to take another look around, and I've memorized your license plates, and I'm going straight to the police station. I better not see you again. I never saw him again. Unfortunately though, I forgot to write down his license plate. The shelter curfew was going into effect soon and I didn't have time to file a report at the station. It didn't occur to me to call the non-emergency number. I also purchased as large of a knife as I legally could for self-defense. I've spent my life in Georgia and love hiking all over. But I must admit, North Carolina has the best mountains. For this reason, I frequently drive up there and hike and camp. 
This time, I went up with my family in an RV and stayed with them in Maggie Valley. The next day, however, I had them drop me off about 10 miles away at the Cold Mountain Trailhead, and I planned to hike up and spend the night and be back down in the morning. I was by no means inexperienced at hiking or camping, but I had never camped alone. On top of that, I didn't bring a pistol. On the way up, the trail was surprisingly strenuous, not necessarily steep. I've hiked some steep stuff out in the west, but more like a ton of ups and downs and feeling like it wouldn't end. Eventually, it began to get darker and I realized I needed to stop and set up while I still had light. So I stopped about a half a mile short of the summit and figured I would continue in the morning. Nothing eventful happened. I set up camp in a really good spot, ate my food, and went into the tent. At this point, I realized I hadn't run into a single other person my entire way up. This wasn't eerie at the time, but soon would be. I have trouble sleeping and usually lay awake for up to an hour trying to sleep. I thought I heard someone lightly walking around the general area because of the rhythm of the steps. I brushed it off as my mind running wild, but I did pull my big old knife out of my bag and put it next to me in the sleeping bag. That morning, I woke up and ate oatmeal. As I ate, I looked over my tent and noticed a strange bundle of dried twigs and berries tied with green cord propped against my tent. Internally, I was pissing myself, but I packed my stuff up and took off within five minutes. And no way I bothered going to the summit. I headed straight down. On the way down, I realized there was a pretty heavy fog, and I ended up on a side trail that eventually ended and I was lost. I used a compass to eventually reorient myself, and I found the trail again. I made it out with no other incident. However, I come to find out the same morning, a 27-year-old died on the same section of trail as me, and it's possible I would have run into him had I not gotten lost and rejoined the trail later. His family seemed to have scrubbed the internet of several articles on him, the scariest part was knowing that someone knew where I was and watched me, and I had no clue about them. Also, the circumstances surrounding the guy's death are weird. You can find articles about him. He supposedly fell trying to climb out of a ravine, but he was away from his backpack and it called 911, but he didn't get to speak to anyone on the line. This is a true story, and I've been kind of obsessing over what the fuck happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving out key details. I grew up deep in the mountains of Shoshone County, an hour from a grocery store. The wilderness is my peace and my home, but these woods, they are evil, and I never should have come to Washington. My wife's uncle bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington, with a friend of the family. They got it at a significant discount because a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the ground and it was impossible to use the water beneath it. They had set up two plots and each had a camper to live in. Jay had been progressively getting paranoid and saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandering through the woods there had an interaction with Jay and ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said he was overcome with a desire to see if he could kill him with a single punch. Two months later, my wife's uncle Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. His friend Kay found him and immediately ran as far away until he stopped to call the police. There was sufficient evidence of who did it and they quickly caught the killer who was a 19 year old boy who said he simply wanted his bike. He beat him to death with a power tool that was lying on the floor nearby, completely bashed his brains in. Kay was completely terrified at all times to be there alone. He had moved in with a family member until eight months later. He ended up with nowhere else to go and he had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and I to come stay with him. The second I turned off the highway onto the property, 
I was overcome with dread. There were at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever the first night. I stared into the forest, searching for the cause of my intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable, and I assumed it was simply just knowing that my wife's uncle Jay was killed here. Even the days were eerie. Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched here. My wife and I always had a sense of fear, especially after dark. Things sort of normalized for a while, until one day, Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said he was fine, probably a flu. At this point, it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming, I can't breathe, waking my wife and I up, and we run out to see what's wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it, crashing into a nearby tree. I run up and peer through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear I have ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later, he breathed out one last time, and he was dead. We gave him CPR for 30 minutes until EMS arrived. On July 10th, one year and three days after moving there with Jay, and they both were dead. Now it's only the wife and I alone on the property. Every moment living in fear and not understanding what had happened here. I don't know why we didn't leave right away. One day I come out to get fresh water from a drum we kept, and I smell the worst thing I'd ever smelled. The water container had a one inch opening on top, and inside the water were bits and pieces of chipmunks, like spines and heads. They didn't fall in. Something ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights were getting worse and worse. I never saw anything other than shadows messing with my eyes. I was nearly always filled with unease and intense fear. Fear in the woods, even at night, is new for me. We all get a little spooked in the thick of the wilderness and pure darkness. But compared to my home, this wasn't even a wilderness. The snapping of branches and pine needles crunching underfoot haunted my every night. The screeching owls loved to chime in right at the height of anxiety. My nights were spent peering into the pines, watching, always waiting for whatever evil to present itself. I knew it was out there, and it wanted me to know it too. One night, my wife and I return home to having the worst feeling I've ever felt. Every second driving up the long dirt road increased my anxiety tenfold. Something bad was ahead, and it was clear. The thick fog shrouded the pines. If it wasn't for the glimmer of the full moon, it would have been pitch black. Everything looked different, although it was right where we left it. Nothing seemed out of place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange, long-haired, manged cat sitting on a stump. The cat's eyes were so intense, fiery, almost glowing but not quite. The cat, in my mind, was the embodiment of pure evil. I saw darkness in its soul. We started hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching, seemingly from every direction. The brush was swaying back and forth, clearly indicating something was running within. Here I am still staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly a voice breaks out, echoing throughout the forest. Hello, is anyone out here? A little girl, I thought, but something was off. My gaze finally breaks with the cat, and my eyes start towards the road. My wife yells back, Hello, are you okay? Anybody? The voice had changed. Help. Help me. It was the same person or thing yelling, but as if it was trying to disguise its voice. We yelled back several times without response. Somebody fucking help me. The most intense, shrieking, evil-sounding voice of a woman called out. It cut deep into my body. I'm filled with more intense fear than I can ever describe. 
but my wife. She's overcome with the need to find this person, and she started to head off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her by the arm, telling her something isn't right. Why won't she respond? She tries to break free from me to go off alone. I tell her to get in the truck and I'll grab the spotlights, but we aren't going on foot. We roll the windows down, and I shine my intensely bright LED lights throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road, yelling back. As we get further down the road, the voice strikes out. Please, why won't anyone fucking help me? The sounds are difficult to pin down in the woods, but this one was very close. I hit the brakes and stopped immediately. We shine the lights and yell back, searching. There's no sign of anyone, when suddenly the voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle, as if they were standing right outside my window. Help me. Somebody fucking help me. Leaving my ears hurting and ringing. I hit the gas and didn't look back. We called the police when I hit the highway, and afterwards they said there was nobody around. I picked up our stuff the next day, and my wife gave birth the following day. We never stayed there again after the baby was born. What the hell could do these things? I have never even believed in paranormal things before, but I don't know what else happened. I was camping out in the desert with four friends, three females and my older buddy. He's a bit weird but cool. We're all on drugs, it's one of the girls' birthdays, and while they're all sleeping in a camper, we're sleeping in our individual tents. It starts to rain pretty heavy, night falls, and everyone returns to their designated spaces. The girls are loud, but still I'm starting to fall asleep when I hear one of them call my name directly. I wake up. They're now yelling at me to come to the camper. Well, alright. I get dressed, unzip the tent, slosh through some mud, knock on the camper door, and they let me inside. They all look pale-faced and shook. I ask them what's wrong, and they tell me something is outside of the camper. I look around, and the party stayed at the van, rolled my eyes, and told them there was nothing out there. But they insisted and made me wait with them until they heard another sound. I remind them that they're on drugs, so it was probably just auditory hallucinations, but they swear it isn't, and I finally relent and sit down and wait. Minutes pass, nothing but the pitter-patter of raindrops, and then suddenly a scratching sound. It sounded just outside the camper. I tell them it's probably a tree branch, but they say it's something else and to go look. I sigh. I grab a flashlight and head out into the rain to do a circle of the camper. Nothing there. No footprints in the mud. No tree branches anywhere close by either. Weird. But there's nothing there. So I go back in and tell them the coast is clear. They're shook and still unsure. So I offer to just sleep there on the floor for a bit. I'm starting to doze off again when I hear a voice whisper. Can you hear me? Yes, I say, and start to wake up. What's up? And the girls are all silent. One of them finally stirs and says, You heard that too. It wasn't me. I sit up and look around. The other two girls are asleep. We're staring into each other's eyes when suddenly, we both, clear as day, hear a child laughing in the other corner of the van. What the fuck was that? I exclaim, and the girl who was awake says that she's heard the laughing before, and that's what scared her. So we wake up the other two to see if they were messing with us. They weren't. They were annoyed. So now I'm thinking, maybe it's someone's phone. We find all the phones and out them together as well as any other electronic devices. Suddenly there's a loud creaking sound just outside the front door. Christ, I yell out thinking maybe it was my guy friend. No response. I grab a broom and slowly open the door and peer outside, but there's no light and I can't see shit. I close the door and I'm freaking out. 
Now I'm wondering if some local townies or other campers were fucking with us. More scratching on the side of the camper. Suddenly I remember my friend is all alone. So I start to yell at him to wake up and to bring his guns over because I think there might be people fucking with us. After yelling for him loudly for 10 minutes, he finally wakes up and yells back that he'll be right over. He gets there and immediately I feel more secure. Two grown ass men, we can handle this. I catch him up to speed and he just mocks us and reminds us we're on drugs and imagining it, but I swear it's something real and he agrees to stay in the camper on the floor with me, ready to charge into the night if need be. We go quiet. We wait five minutes. Ten. Fifteen. We're falling asleep. And then the giggles. The damn child laughter returns from just outside the van. My friend thinks it's one of the girls messing with us and tells us to just go to sleep. They swear it's not them but he doesn't believe them and just lays back down. Not ten seconds later, there's a loud creak sound again and scratching, and it sounds like someone is just outside. He sits up alert, looks at our horrified faces with the same expression, we told you so, and he rushes out of the camper into the darkness and rain, and we hear him fly around the van yelling, but he comes back and reports. No one was there. We start to talk about the campground being haunted. Old burying ground maybe. We don't know. At this point we're jabbering on just to hear our own voices. We all agree to just stay awake until the morning. The sun rises. The rain dries up. We pack up and leave. I'm getting gas in a local town when suddenly the thoughts hit me. I google. Psst, can you hear me? And this is when I discover the evil Tron. Yes, friends. A small, sadistic, sinister electronic device that emits creepy sounds and can be attached to any metal surface. It was my weird friend. He had hid it underneath the girl's whippet canister. In fact, it wasn't theirs. It was his canister, and they lifted it from his tent while he slept. But he knew. He knew what they'd try and he tricked them, like a Trojan horse, into bringing the device into their camper. I was collateral damage, and he just went with it, silently chuckling to himself. The mastermind. The damn mastermind. The fallout was bad between him and the girls, but I thought it was the best prank I'd ever seen pulled off. To this day, bravo. I was far up north, far north British Columbia, Canada, working in an oil rig camp out in the woods. I was working as a cook. I went out one afternoon for a smoke on the back deck. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was a very quiet, still winter day. It was snowing those kind of big snowflakes that make it look like the world's moving in slow motion. So, as I was standing there smoking, just staring off in the distance, not looking at anything in particular. You know, looking left, right, up and down, and at my feet, whatever. I felt something looking at me. Then I looked straight ahead. About thirty feet or less in front of me was the tree line in the forest, and directly in front of me, in between two trees, I see the most gigantic wolf I've ever seen. This thing sitting looked like it was the size of a man standing. It was massive, sitting there and just staring right at me. We locked eyes, then I looked away for a split second and then looked back and it was gone. I don't know, it just gave me the weirdest feeling. It was definitely like, hey, I see you, I could eat you, but I won't. Okay, bye. It's something I will always remember. Two or three times a year, we vacation in a cabin in the wilderness. Me, my wife, and our three young children and two dogs. 
I'm no stranger to the wild and have made a lot of multiple day and week solo trips in national parks and even in the Arctic Circle. Yesterday I went for a 10 mile solo hike. At the farthest point, after two hours, I heard my children arguing, playing, crying, laughing and calling me from the forest. I was totally alone and my first instinct was to run through the thick brush and trees to where the sound was coming from, but then I realized that it couldn't be my kids and that I should just walk on and ignore it. I decided to walk back to the cabin. The whole family was there and never left. I know how my children sound and I swear it was them. Later I realized the combination of all the sounds, laughing, crying and playing and whatnot, made no sense. What was this experience? What did I hear? My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent tens of thousands of hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, We've traveled across the US exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, and whatever else, since 2016 when we get the time off. I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We're both mid-twenties, and it was 2019. This was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us, and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically the middle of nowhere. The nearest main road is probably eight to ten miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked, then ate, had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong, and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet, so I think it was around 4.30am. We sat in my tent, and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds, different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because what I was hearing didn't seem real and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, I felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth every single one. 
My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. This happened circa 1971 or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Montevallo, Alabama. My mother is the oldest of five children, and she has three sisters and a brother, who's the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people in total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle, if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembered the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding, and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want the help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he dragged her out of the car. So my father cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seat right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they'd just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he'd just taken his family out for target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continue driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming. He killed that lady. He killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. This is something that happened to me five or so years ago. I was fresh out of university with my degree in international development. 
I wanted to help underserved communities develop meaningful projects and see more of the world. I was young. I was naive. Eager to get started, I took one of the first jobs that offered me a position. It wasn't something I necessarily wanted to do, but it was adjacent to my interests and, more importantly, took me to a place I'd never seen before. I loved everything when I arrived. It was beautiful, sunny, and green. My new co-workers, all local staff, were amazing and so kind. My boss invited me to play soccer on Sundays with his family. My fellow project coordinator would go out dancing with me on the weekends. My roommate, a fellow expat working in development as well, was a fun and spunky woman I adored. I felt so blessed. Then, one day, it changed. I was walking downtown with a friend. There was a vegetable and fruit market that had great fresh produce directly from the farmers growing it. It was about a 20 minute bus ride from my apartment, so not close, but not incredibly far either. My friend and I loaded up and began walking over to a quiet corner to call a cab to help us haul our goods back. Then I heard it. Hey, hey miss, and the guy recited my exact address. It took me to a second to realize he was shouting my address. I turned around to see a man hanging out of his car, slowly crawling along the road with us. My friend recognized my address too. She turned to me and asked, Do you know him? I'd never seen him before. He kept shouting, Yeah, you. You're living in the back house on the second floor, right? That made it even worse. I lived on a big suburban lot with two houses, one in the front where my landlady and her family lived, and the second in the back. The second house was split into two apartments. The bottom floor housed two students, while I lived on the second floor with my roommate. You couldn't see the second house from the road, much less the stairway that led to the second floor. My heart was pounding. I wanted to shout back at the guy, but I was scared. I was a 22-year-old woman living in a foreign country, and I didn't want to draw attention. I didn't know how people would react. I didn't know how he would react. So we walked. My friend tried to comfort me, saying that maybe he knew my landlady's family. I was probably the only redhead in the whole country. He could be my neighbor I hadn't met. The encounter didn't leave me. It stayed in my mind. A week or so passed and I stopped glancing behind my back whenever a car drove by. I started to feel secure. Then he showed up again. I was walking home from work. It was getting dark. My office was a 15 to 20 minute stroll from my apartment. Perfect as a quick way to stretch my legs. I was halfway home when I felt someone watching me. Then, the slow crawl of a car sidling up beside me. I knew it was him without looking. He recited my address while leaning out of his window, one hand on the wheel. Why are you shy? He asked. I ignored him and kept walking. There was no one around. It was getting dark. Come on. He cajoled. Let me give you a ride. I know where you live. Not reassuring. I started to feel my chest tighten. I wanted to call someone but I didn't know what he'd do if I reached for my phone. I was practically jogging now, but he just sped up to match my pace. Listen, bitch. And now he was angry, his voice hard. You don't just ignore a man like that. I wondered what he'd do if he stopped the car. He looked fit and young. He could probably catch me. He could hurt me. So I did something that, in retrospect, seemed absolutely bizarre. I yelled at him, wildly, rapidly. I did it in my first language, not what they spoke in this country, not a language he would have ever heard, probably. I screamed curse words and threats, anything I could think of. I'll never forget the confused fury on his face, but he did slow down, letting me run ahead. I could see a woman at a bus stop at the intersection ahead, if I got to her, maybe she'd help. Maybe he'd get scared off. By the time I got to the woman, he was gone. I kept walking home, looking behind me with every step. 
I told my roommate about what had happened. She told me not to bother reporting it to the police, since they were corrupt and wouldn't do anything. When I told my boss, he told me the same. He said he had a baseball bat and would come whenever I called. I saw the man again two weeks later. He was sitting in his car, parked in front of the gates to my apartment. I had been about to take the trash out, but retreated before he could see me. I told my landlady, and when she went over to confront him, he drove off. This continued for weeks. Not every day, but once or twice a week. He was always there, waiting. I took cabs to and from work. I never traveled alone. I barely slept, waiting for him to break in and kill me. My last weekend abroad, he almost did. I went out drinking with a group of my friends, four of us in total. We were celebrating the end of my contract and I was happy to go home in a few days. I couldn't wait to see my family. I couldn't wait to put an ocean between me and the man. We had beers at a local bar, a 5-10 to ten minute walk max from my apartment. When it started to get late, around 1, we tried to get a cab, but it was impossible. The roads were jammed and people were everywhere outside. Cabs couldn't even get to us. So, we thought, even though others warned us not to, let's walk home. It would be faster than calling a cab. We'll be fine. We're a group of four. No one will hassle us. We got halfway there when we had to cross a main road. There were no street lights. Not that kind of place. The road was absolutely empty. Not a single car in sight. We crossed the road. A few more minutes, but then we were backlit with the bright headlights of a car coming up. We glanced back. A cop car. Two men in the front. And I knew... Even though I couldn't see from the bright lights in my eyes, he was driving. He was a fucking cop. The jeep slowed as I knew it would. He rolled down the window to draw. Hey, miss. Reciting my address. Nice night, yeah? My friends immediately knew who he was. I could see how nervous they were. We were alone on a dark, empty street in the middle of the night. They were cops, so they were armed. No one would intervene, probably. It was too dangerous. You girls need a ride, he leered. His friend, who I could see now, was grinning hugely. My last few days, I thought. And this is how it ends. We sped up our pace. I don't know what our plan was, other than to get away. Then I heard one of the doors of the jeep open as the passenger jumped out. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life, although I didn't dare turn back to see. We were at the turn to my street now, two minutes more to get to safety. The car was right behind us. Whoever had gotten out of the car was right behind us. Two of my friends were now ahead, while another clutched my hand and dragged me along. Then, out of nowhere... Another car appeared. They were coming from the opposite direction, illuminating us all. When they slowed to see what was going on, I've never been so grateful. It was an older couple, and they looked concerned. I think they knew something very bad was about to happen. I heard, not saw, the car door swing open. I almost got hit as they sped past us in a hurry. The other car stayed, watching. They offered to escort us home, driving alongside just in case, but I knew he wouldn't come back. Not tonight. I still took a cab with my friends to their place for the night. We took my roommate with us, just in case. Nothing happened after that. My last two days were uneventful, although I couldn't shake the feeling that he might show up at any given moment. Driving to the airport, all packed up and ready to go home, my cab got pulled over by a cop. My stomach dropped. I couldn't breathe. It wasn't him, although it could have been. It wasn't until I got on the plane, until I landed in my home country, that I finally felt that terror leave me. I still get nervous when cars drive up behind me, when men roll down their windows to shout at me. It's never him, 
but still, you never know. It's roughly nine on a Saturday evening. I'm sat in the passenger seat of an armed response vehicle, driving around a problem estate in the north of my city. In the driver's seat is Adam, a close friend and experienced firearms officer with seven years on the unit. All is well at this moment. So far we have seized a stolen moped that we stumbled upon in the same estate, and have also attended a road traffic collision, in which we applied aid to the driver until paramedics arrived. All patrols, all patrols, from control. Stay safe, stay safe. The area of Orchard Road, due to an active firearms deployment. The radio beams into life with that message. At this moment, we are prepared to be called up and immediately begin discussing options for gear and tactics. All right, if we pull up here and gear up, I'll grab my conventional, and if you go conventional and baton round, Adam asks me. Yeah, mate. Pull up here and we can start getting kitted, I replied. We pulled up into a nearby car park that was virtually empty and began to gear up. At that moment, the radio came to life again. TFC, TFC, all hotel units. Can I have you moving to the area of Orchard Road, please? Switch to TAC Ops 1 for brief. We are at this point sat in our cars listening to the brief. We switch our radios over to TAC Ops 1 channel and wait. There is silence. TFC, TFC, all hotel units and channel call up by call sign. The tactical firearms commander calls up, breaking the silence. Following this, units begin to call up, five others in total, along with a dog van. Hotel Sierra 31, I called into the radio. All hotel units from the TFC, this job pertains to multiple logs between 2030 and 2045 hours, regarding an address in Orchard Road. The informants state loud screams and bangs consistent with an assault or fight are audible from the address. At 2050, three response assets requested assistance, claiming there to be a subject inside of the address with another person making threats to officers, themselves, and the other subject. At the present moment in time, 2104, I'll be authorizing a firearms authority. Hotel Romeo 72, I'll be declaring yourself the operational firearms commander. So far. So far, he replied. Received. Units straight to scene deployment, please. TFC out, 2106. Adam and I now began kidding up, both selecting to take our G36 carbines, while I also brought a less than lethal AEP launcher along as a precaution. Within minutes, we are racing to the scene seven miles away. As we near to the property around a mile away, we bump into one of the ARVs, the radio has remained quiet while we have been responding. We pulled up to the property. Police vehicles lined the streets, with officers visible at the front of the premises. Cordons have already been erected around the street, and the dog van is already on scene, with the handler at the front door. 3-1, we're state 5, I said onto the channel, letting them know we had arrived. We pulled up onto the curb. I stepped out, quickly being approached by a response officer who began to brief me on the situation. Hello, mate. We've got two females inside of the premises that we know of, one of which is holding the other one hostage. She's barricaded them in and is making threats to us and the hostage. The dog handler has been putting challenges in. Unfortunately, no progress has been made as of yet, he said to me. Right, okay. Have we got containment with tasers and knowledge of anybody else inside? I replied to him. Yeah, we've got taser officers on the back and front door. We've checked, and there are no other methods of escape, unless she feels like jumping out of a window. And they're covered too. And we've not seen anybody or heard anybody mentioned, so we're unsure right now, he said. Adam and the two firearms officers from the other vehicle now joined us, as we stood beside our ARV being briefed. I turned around, facing the other firearms officers, asking them, You lads hear all that? Each replied yes via nods and words to the effect of that. Okay, what do we think? Contain and call out, maybe try and get a negotiator? I asked them. Well, if we try and get negotiations going now, obviously if this escalates, we'll go for an emergency search. 
one of the officers chimed in. Yeah, I agree with that, I commented, as the remainder of the officers also added their approval in. Right, let's go in, gents. We've still got about four ARVs towards anyways, so we can update them. But let's sort ourselves out, I now said. All right, I'll update control if you lads want to go up, Adam replied. I now walked up to the front of the house, followed by the two firearms officers. About eight officers were positioned around the front, two with their tasers drawn, while the dog handler stood holding his dog, ready to deploy him. The other officers were positioned in cover, with one attempting to speak to the subject. Hello, we're already briefed. If none of the TTOs want to get back for us, please. Four of the officers, minus the two officers with taser, dog handler, and the officer attempting to speak to the subject, now walked back from the front, allowing us space. I now peek through the window, seeing an open door that led to a well-lit kitchen, in the doorway of which were two figures, who I could identify to be about five foot roughly, one of which had its arms around the front of the other, and an object in front of their throat, S and V. The rest of the house, minus the kitchen, was pitch black, and I could hear whimpers and crying, clearly coming from the person with something to their neck through the open window. I raised my carbine to an off-aim ready position. Contact, two subjects, I now said, telling the other officers I could see the pair. A snap was audible behind me as I heard one of the officers preparing his baton launcher. The other was peeking further to my right, with his taser drawn in his right hand. Armed police, stay exactly there. Get your hands up now. I said loudly through to the pair. S reached across to the right, switched on a light, at which point the room I was looking through, I believed to be the living room, lit up. I could now see a knife across V's throat. Oh, knife. Drop the fucking knife now. I screamed at S now, raising my rifle at the pair. I'll chop her if you come in here, you fucking rat. Fuck off out of it, S replied. Drop the knife now, armed police officers. The officer to my right now shouted at her. Drop it, drop it now, I repeated towards her. Adam had rushed up to us at this moment, holding an enforcer. Hotel Romeo 49 to TFC, one of the other officers called into the radio. Go ahead, 49, the TFC replied. Yes, yes. Currently a containment and call-out, two occupants, one with a knife. If we can have a negotiations officer towards please, and an ETA on further ARVs. 4-9, received from TFC. All ARVs are within a five-minute ETA at this moment in time. I'll attempt to source a negotiations officer. The TFC replied, Yes, yes, many thanks, the officer now said, ending the exchange. At this moment, another ARV pulled up as three ARVOs, one of which being the OFC, got out and approached us. Sit rep, the OFC said. Two occupants, one with a knife, one believed to be a victim. Threats made to occupants and officers. Negotiation should be on way. Light challenges in place so far. All right, let's try comms with them. Prepare for an emergency search. While this was going on, I still had the pair in my sights. My carbine still trained on S. Can we get a shield on this side to cover us? And maybe one with long arm, one with launcher, and the shield guy with side arm or something? I suggested. Yeah, good shout. Officer, go grab me a shield mate. Officer 2, if you want to move to the right side with a crayon and cover with a launcher. One officer ran back to his ARV to retrieve a shield. Meanwhile, the second officer moved over to my right shoulder now raising his AEP launcher at the pair. Drop the knife now and you'll come to no harm. I now said to S. I'll fucking do all of yous. Fuck off, you rats. S replied. It doesn't need to be like this. Just drop the knife. I'm not coming out. Fuck off home. S now screamed, growing more agitated. We're gonna need to move, I said to the UFC. All right, let's get the door in. We'll go for a victim-led emergency search, lads. Everybody good with that, the OFC said. One by one, we each agreed that we were happy with it. OFC, TFC, the OFC now called into the radio. Go ahead, 
the TFC replied. Yes, yes. We're gonna make entry for a victim-led emergency search. Can you get some assets from the Ambo to stage and standby, please? Yes, that's received, the TFC replied, ending the interaction. All right, let's get that shield on the door and get ready. The final two ARVs arrived, containing two ARVOs each. They quickly moved up to the front door. All right, two persons inside, one with a knife, one believed to be a hostage. Threats have been made to officers and the subject. We're going for a victim-led emergency search, another officer said, informing the four new arrivals. Right, let's get the enforcer up and use the dog to our advantage, the OFC said. Adam positioned himself to the left of the door, ready to use the enforcer. Meanwhile, the shield officer beside me and the officer with the launcher repositioned to the front door. I repositioned behind him, still holding my rifle. Behind me was an officer with a taser, and behind him was an officer with a lethal option. Another officer with a launcher moved to the window we were previously stationed on, and continued to hold cover on them. Meanwhile, another officer stood to the side of the door, ready to deploy the stun grenades. Adam slammed the enforcer into the door repeatedly. As he did this, the door appeared to begin to give way. Armed police! Armed police! The shield officer shouted as the door continued to be hammered on. The door swung inwards violently as it had been hit to breaking point. Door, Adam said, indicating to anybody who may not be looking that the door was now in. He then dropped the enforcer and moved onto the back of the stack, unholstering his sidearm. Armed police! Armed police! Any persons inside of the premises, show us your hands! The shield officer shouted as we moved into the doorway. The OFC and four other officers joined the stack as we did this. Two officers broke off to the left, holding at the bottom of the stairs. Meanwhile, another officer moved to the very bottom of the stairs, covering them, while the shield officer moved into the doorway of the room I'd been looking through. Contact, the shield officer shouting as he saw S. She was alone with her hands up. As I moved up now, I also saw her. Armed police, stay where you are now. Hands on top of your head, I shouted, giving her an initial command. The officer with the taser behind me moved to my right, red dotting her with his taser. S lifted her hands onto her head, staying stationary. Interlock your fingers, I now instructed her. S interlocking her fingers, shuffling a bit. Right, slowly begin to walk towards us. If you make any sudden movements, you'll be tasered. Start walking when you're told. Can somebody with a launcher move up on our right, please, lads? I said, asking for somebody in the stack. The sixth officer in the stack, holding a launcher, now moved up onto the right of me and the officer with the taser. All right, cover on, he said, indicating he had a shot on her. Right, start walking. S began to take small steps towards us, her hand still on her head, looking straight at us. As she did this, the laser from the taser being pointed at her bounced around her torso. S was now four feet or so from us. Stop there. Turn around. S complied, stopping in her tracks, turning around. Walk backwards to the sound of my voice, slowly. S now began slowly walking backwards. As she did this, Adam moved up behind us, holding his cuffs. Stop there, I instructed S as she was now pretty much right next to us. Adam moved the cuffs into our view to let us know he was about to move up and restrain her before moving between us up to her and restraining her. He then moved her back and out onto the street before returning back onto the stack. We advanced to the next door as the room was cleared by the last three on the stack. As we moved up, we could see V on the floor. She did not appear to be injured however, was crying and clearly terrified. Stand up for us, please, I said to her. V attempted to, but clearly couldn't due to fear or shock or something of that nature, as a result of which we decided to take a more physical approach. The shield officer moved up, facing the right of the kitchen which was yet to be cleared. I held my carbine in an off-aim position near to V, as the officer behind me helped her to her front and handcuffed her to her front, before handing her off to Adam, who took her outside. 
We then moved up, clearing the rest of the kitchen before walking back to the main room, stacking on the stairs. We then climbed the stairs, seeing three doors, one ahead and two behind us on a bend. The landing was very small and narrow. The shield officer pressed up to the left facing two doors behind us as two other officers and I followed. Meanwhile, three other officers cleared the room that was ahead and the rest held on the stairs. We approached the first door which was found to be unlocked as one of the officers in the stack moved and covered the other door. The shield operator opened the door, moving into the doorway before moving further into the room. As he did this, I peeked right and the officer behind me peeked left. Finding both corners to be clear, we then pressed further in, checking wardrobes and under beds and everything else. We then moved out and stacked on the second door on our side, also found to be unlocked. The shield officer opened the door, revealing a cupboard that was pitch black, at which point he activated the torch on his sidearm, revealing it to be clear. He moved as far as he could in, as we cleared the corners, before ensuring there was nobody hiding inside. We now turned over to the officers, who had found nothing in the other room. The bathroom. Property secure, lads, I said. OFC, update. Two detained, property secure. The OFC said into the radio. Yes, yes, that's received OFC, the TFC replied. We then went downstairs before exiting the property, splitting up. Adam picked up the discarded enforcer he used previously as we walked to our ARV. Adam stored the enforcer before taking his helmet and mask off. Meanwhile, I unloaded and stored my carbine and baton launcher. I then removed my contacts, mask, and gloves. TFC, all hotel units. Firearms authority rescinded, 2118, the TFC said, meaning we should store our equipment, which was already done. We then walked over to the OFC's ARV where the OFC, his crewmate, and two other officers were talking. We were quickly joined by the three other crews. One of the divisional sergeants came over to update us. Hello lads, the subject is off to custody. The victim is with Ambo. She's safe and well. We're gonna get Soko to come over for a search. Alright mate, thanks for the help. One of the officers replied before the sergeant walked off. Right, see you guys later. We're gonna clear off, I said to the group. Adam and I then walked back over to our ARV and left the scene, finishing our shift. We later found out that S was convicted for her offense and was issued a two-year suspended sentence and was forced to attend an alcoholic treatment program. It was also revealed that the cause for the incident was domestic abuse. Alright, I live in a major city in the south. It's a pretty big city, and as such, one finds themselves driving everywhere at all hours of the day. This is not an elaborate story, nor typically terrifying, but there's enough left unanswered that it still gives me the creeps to think about. It was around 1.30am, and I was driving home from a friend's house with my then-girlfriend, Allison. We'd been partying a bit. But as I was driving, I opted to maintain sobriety. Allison had a few drinks, but nothing serious and over the course of several hours. Now, the house I was leaving is not in a particularly bad neighborhood, but not a good one either. The city where I live, there are lots of gentrified areas where crack dealers live next to four-person families. It's a place where you are fine in the daytime, but you wouldn't want to be walking the streets alone late at night. Being familiar with the area, I decide to take a little cut through street. As I pull onto the street, I end up at a stop sign. I look behind me, and there's a truck that pulls out of an adjacent road behind me to my left. I move forward from the stop sign, and he continues to follow me. I think nothing of it. The road doesn't have many street lamps, so it's pretty dark, and I can't get a look inside the truck's cab. I drive about another 20 feet and all of a sudden I see blue lights in my rearview mirror. Cop lights. Now I think, oh shit, not again. However, 
as I look into the rearview mirror, I notice several things that don't seem right. For one, there aren't many police trucks in the inner city area. Sure, there are some, but they're not common. Secondly, the police lights are not on top of the cab like a normal cop car, but next to the actual headlights by the grill, like a detective's car. I also notice there's an air freshener dangling from his rearview mirror. I've dealt with police officers on numerous occasions, but I've never seen one with a stereotypical pine tree freshener. Lastly, as I kept moving forward, slowly contemplating the situation, considering pulling over, I noticed the final strange variable. There is no police siren, no horn, no noise. It was late, it was dark, and I continued to drive slowly as I thought about all the odd factors. If I'd only noticed the first two factors, I think I may have stopped, but the fact that the blue lights kept flashing without any sirens was just off. I know in my state, it is legal to pull into a well-lit area at nighttime just for these circumstances. I decided that the air freshener, the position of the lights, and the lack of sirens was just too weird. I wasn't going to risk pulling over in a bad area, so I decided to move forward at around 20 miles per hour until I got to a gas station. The truck continues to follow me. There are a lot of speed bumps and road signs on this road, and thinking there's a possibility of a cop pulling me over, I abide by all the laws. The final straw that I determined made this truck a false police officer. He also obeyed all the traffic laws. When a cop wants to pull you over, you pull over. And if they don't, they aren't going to let you stop at a stop sign to let you get away. This guy stopped when I stopped, moved forward when I did, and even turned as I decided to get to a more populated road. After about a hundred yards, he turns off his lights. Both the blue lights and his main headlights. He takes a left behind me and peels away. It was at that moment I knew he was not a cop. I don't know exactly what I avoided that night. I drive a nice car, so it could have been a carjacking. But I don't rule out something worse. If it weren't for my ex-girlfriend's presence, I may have stopped. Ultimately, I'm just happy I didn't. This happened almost a decade ago when I was 13 years old. I remember my friend and I were excited about our first time trick-or-treating without our parents. We lived in a small town where nothing ever happens and we thought it would be the same that night. It started like any other Halloween night. We collected candy, ran into many of our classmates, and had a lot of fun. At 8pm we realized we had to head home, but on the way back we dropped by our teacher's house. She wasn't home, and the street didn't have many street lights. To add to this, most of the houses had their lights turned off, and their Halloween decorations were taken down. My friend and I were slightly spooked and disappointed by the lack of candy. We wanted to get out of the street as soon as possible. That's when a man emerged from under one of the few street lights. It was a police officer. Neither of us seemed to notice him before this, possibly due to the darkness. He startled us, but seemed very friendly. The cop introduced himself and pointed to an inconspicuous bungalow. He said an older man living in this house was inviting trick-or-treaters inside. Someone called the police, but when he arrived, no one was answering the door. He kept telling us his police car and partner were just around the block. We looked around, but couldn't see them. I was a pretty paranoid kid. Growing up, my mom loved watching crime shows, and she'd always tell me tidbits of lessons. One of these was a story about fake cops, although I don't remember the details. I remembered people can pretend to be police officers to gain trust. Throughout this whole exchange, I was terrified. His lack of badge, police car, and partner did not feel right. I was also conflicted because he was smiling and seemed like he just wanted to help. That was until we heard his strange request. He said he needed to speak to this potential predator and needed our help. Since we were young girls, the man would answer if we knocked. The officer claimed he would hide behind the bushes next to the front door. 
he would wait for him to invite us in, jump out, and catch him red-handed. At that moment, I knew my friend felt the same way I did. We both fell silent, but one of us managed to ask if we could discuss. The cop said yes, but told us we had limited time. The street was silent. He could hear everything. I remember feeling the way of wanting to say something, but fearing he would hear us and escalate the situation. We just stared at each other for what felt like forever. The cop was getting increasingly impatient and told us we had to decide quickly. Around that moment, a family came down the street and noticed the officer. They were coming over to see what was happening. That's when the cop said he'd be right back and did not go anywhere. My friend and I scrambled to collect our thoughts and decided to run away. We sprinted out of the street and didn't look back. On our way home, we discussed theories that ranged from him being a fake cop, him playing a prank on us, or him being a real cop but we misunderstood the situation. When we told our parents, we downplayed it a lot and doubted our experience. In the end, we didn't call the police but our dads drove to that house and the area around the house. There were no cop cars or police officers in sight. Over the years, I can't say I regret not calling the police. At the time, my friend and I were convinced we misunderstood what was happening. We even told our class the next day and most, including our teacher, thought it was not alarming. Looking back, I find it extremely strange a police officer would put two children in such a potentially dangerous situation, moreover with our parents not present. I wonder what his motives were, but it will, unfortunately, remain unsolved. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoid, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, the Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeptepi, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, 
Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.